Okay, uh, hello everybody, welcome to The Wonky Angle, where I talk about electronic music, both new and old. And uh, today, uh, as a Patreon request from the artist in question, I, I'm talking about this new-ish album from Stanley Like Scion, Constructed Directions. Okay, welcome to the newest artist to win the sweepstakes for $10 request I ended up wanting to highlight in a proper video instead of a text post. Stanley Piper is a British artist with basically no audience, presumably outside of his family and friends. He's been semi-regularly putting out music on Bandcamp since early 2020, and apparently he was only 14 when he, per when he put out his first release on the site. He sent in this album for me to hopefully highlight in a quick text post on my Patreon, which I think I've mentioned a few times over the years I tend not to have especially high expectations for. Most artists who request on that tier tend not to be much more than less well-produced versions of their favorite artists, and I can typically just knock out some quick thoughts on them in like an afternoon or something. But every once in a blue moon, I'll run into a request that either actually does resonate with me enough or it gives me enough to say where I decide they're actually worth my time to go on t camera to talk about. It happened in 2021 with Dakuan's Memphis Innovation, when the artist turned out to have way more genuine cred in his genre than I ever could have anticipated, and just happened to send me some of the most fun and visceral techno material I'd heard out all year. And before that, it also happened with Animus' The Sundown Realm, where the artist, despite being very young and not having much technical production ability, was trying on a lot of really ambitious and out-of-the-box ideas and further-reaching concepts that I couldn't really sum up in a quick text post. Stanley Like Cyan is very much another case in the same vein as uh, the latter. After hearing Constructed Directions, I had so much to say about it that I knew uh, it was going to require a full video for me to e be able to fully gather my thoughts. Now, be warned, not all of these thoughts are positive. Uh, there are some fairly glaring issues and a lot of very strange, conflicted feelings I came out of it with that I'll have to get into with this project as well. But not to worry too much, I do feel like I came out of it more positive than not. Like, for once, you know what isn't one of my issues? Mastering. It's very common for obscure Bandcamp artists like this to not really have their the hang of their production chops and make a listening experience that can feel very flat and not really pop out to me as much as it could. But this album doesn't really have that problem. These mixes are all pretty well balanced and allow for the right amount of groove and atmosphere you'd want. The album also dodges the typical problem of feeling too derivative. I feel like Stanley Like Cyan did a good job of nailing down his own sort of musical identity that isn't drowning in his influences or easily pinned down to chasing after some specific artist he likes. Ostensibly, his primary focus is on some fairly straightforward ambient techno, though there are some very mild jazz and dub and instrumental hip-hop tinges as well, I guess. I might think of artists like Sounds from the Ground or Wayward a little bit, but weird as it is to say, <laughs> uh, the closest stylistic match I know of might just be my own music as 256Pi. There is a very similar vibe to this uh, to some of my old albums like Marble Jar and Spiral Out of Control, especially thanks to this overwhelming vibe that's trying to evoke imagery of being out in the city. And frankly, listening to it put me right in the exact same headspace I was at uh, circa 2016 when I was going to college in downtown Chicago and working on the latter of those albums. Though even my music isn't that close a match either, his music is made up of very different sonic ingredients as well. Seems to be uh, more built out of synth and percussion elements that are more a little more built from scratch compared to my own typical sample loop based uh, methods. And it especially sets itself apart from my stuff thanks to seemingly every track here having a bunch of vocal samples and found recordings from him and his friends talking, which gives the whole project this particularly goofy student film edge to it. Probably the most unique thing about it stylistically. This decently well varied too and did a good job of keeping my attention throughout its whole running time. Tracks range from some ambient techno, as seen on cuts like Departure and The Experience, which do have some pretty solid spacey grooves to them that can both be atmospheric and danceable. There's cuts that have a slight bit more of an experimental edge, as seen on tracks like A Very Strange Night and A Very Strange Night Part 2, <laughs> uh, warping samples of crowds at a party and working them into uh, some more off-kilter IDM-influenced grooves. There's cuts which have more of a straightforward ambient and down-tempo approach as seen on tracks like Lift Going Insane or Epilogue or the meaning behind ambient music, uh, which feature a lot of really nice pads and MIDI piano excursions. 
There's also the track People Bond, which combines a fairly muted loop of bass and pianos with an echoing burial-style vocal sample in the background, and eventually evolves into a more hard-hitting drum and bass cut. That one was almost certainly my favorite in the bunch. There's the opener cut, Someone Else Now, which tries for this nerdy, not-really-hip-hop mix of plotting beats and his own scatting vocals. <laughs> and actually turns out to be decently catchy. And of course I can't forget a cut like Year to Forget and A Night to Remember, a chopped up sound collage of various performances from his, I think, school talent shows uh, that were recorded in the middle of the pandemic, and he was able to assemble together into a more coherent tune than you'd expect. A lot of really nice ideas throughout, and they all add up to that overarching atmosphere that is meant to evoke imagery of being in the city. But that's not even to get into the fact that this project, on top of its more unique sound and approach, is the fact that it's also trying to be this really ambitious concept record and tell a coherent story over the course of its 13 interlocking tracks. Every cut is directly trying to play into this overarching story. And while I do feel like that story is told in such a way that is very easy to understand, that aspect of this album is admittedly where pretty much all of my biggest issues with the project lie, and I start to uh, feel like it might be going a bit out of its depth. Before I heard this album for this first time, I skimmed over the Bandcamp description, which outlines the story and concept behind the record in detail. The story behind this project shows this protagonist character, some younger guy I suppose in his late teens or early 20s, moving out of his parents' house and into the city. He moves into a flat with some roommates who he becomes friends with and they take him out clubbing. Uh, at the club, the kid ends up taking some LSD, causing him to lose all sense of reality and start to go insane. He leaves the party and is chased after by his roommates. He starts to feel like the LSD is going to do irreversible brain damage, so he jumps in front of a moving train and kills himself. That escalated quickly. And then after that, there's a whole section which I guess is meant to symbolize him being in the afterlife, thinking that he's wasted it into his entire future for a moment, but then, like, looks back over his childhood memories and decides, eh, you know, actually this could have been worse. At least I lived the life I had to the fullest. Okay, so, uh, this story is, <laughs> on paper, really dark and messed up. And that could, theoretically, be a compelling idea for a record on its own, but when it comes to the music itself, this album is not that dark at all. <laughs> it's mostly a lighthearted feel-good listen, honestly. I mean, sure, it's a bit on the moody and atmospheric side, but it's not remotely as, like, dark or serious as that story would have you believe. I already mentioned how the opening track has scatting on it, not even the only track to have that, there's a little more of that in this one interlude called Message, which happens early on, shows the kid leaving a phone message to his parents and you can hear him messing around with his friends in the background. And those samples keep creeping up and adding to that jokey and lighthearted tone. Be it the track Mysterious Purple Cafe, where some kid talks about liking to eat toenail clippings, uh, the track Epilogue, which starts with a fake advertising monologue about SUVs getting machine guns attached to them. Instead of killing people slowly via climate change, you can now just mow down pedestrians yourself. There's moments where he goes really on the nose and over-explains the concept, uh, like the experience being covered in voices saying, Welcome to the experience! and ending in a sample saying, and this is where everything goes horribly wrong. Or the lyrics of the opening track, which are about the protagonist going out to live in the city for the very first time, expressed by uh, him saying, back to the city. This is about uh, someone going out to the city for the very first time. He even breaks the fourth wall a couple of times. Like at the end of A Very Strange Night Part 2, where he includes a sample talking to a friend of his directly about how he made this track out of a found recording at a party, then metaphorically turns directly to the camera to mention to you, the listener, that this is an example of some self-aware stuff in music. Oh god. And then something similar happens on the closer, the meaning of ambient music, when he talks to another one of his friends directly about what the point of the ending with, of the story was supposed to be, and outlines exactly what the last three tracks were supposed to symbolize in case you weren't able to put it together yourself. Really, just leaves so much up to the imagination there. <laughs> but all these problems most glaringly come to a head on the interlude track, Mind the Gap, which is very obviously meant to be the moment at which the protagonist dies. 
uh, but is handled with all the emotional gravitas of a Scott the Waz sketch. <laughs> First thing you hear is another sample saying, had a hard day at work, you could use a coffin. And then after the train passes, there's this fake news narration of, a man has been found dead on the train tracks. You stupid fool. When this track first came up, I burst out laughing, but felt really weird about it in the process. I'd like, should I be laughing at this? Should this have been played for a joke in the way that it was? Wasn't this supposed to be about this young guy killing himself while under the influence of LSD? This feels like the very wrong tone to be taking for the subject matter. <laughs> Granted, I will admit that this story being about suicide is more mentioned in the Bandcamp description than it is actively implied in the text of the music. If I hadn't read that description, I would have been able to put together that the main character did drugs and got hit by a train. <laughs> But I would have assumed that the protagonist's death was completely accidental. The much more pleasant and comforting tone of a track like People Bond coming in between the tracks symbolizing the LSD trip and Mind the Gap symbolizing his death seemed to imply more of a feeling that the main character had started to recover from the drugs and that his friends were still looking out for him. Like, this album is not remotely equipped to be exploring themes of mental health, drug addiction, or self-destruction and none of that is supported by the music in the first place. It's basically about one guy who lived a perfectly fine life without much of anything in the way of pain or suffering until he had this one single comically unlucky night. The artist even directly admits in the Bandcamp description that the album's story isn't based on any of his real life experiences or even the real emotions he's felt and yeah, that's another thing I didn't need to be told to figure out. If this album were based in his real life experiences, it would not have had this carefree jokey tone to everything. But at the end of the day, despite all of these problems I had, weirdly enough, I don't think this ended up cutting into my enjoyment to the album as much as it could have. At least not with repeat listens. Really, this comes down to me disagreeing with the artist's interpretation of the album's themes he provided in his own Bandcamp description, and not as much with what he actually portrayed in the music itself. I don't get offended when I watch the Scott the Waz mystery movie special and see a story where people get murdered and it's played for a joke. And weirdly enough, I'm able to get into this album a lot more easily if I treat it in the same way as something like that. When I first heard this album, I thought the incorporations of random vocals from him and his friends bordered on openly cringeworthy, but with enough repeat listens, I ended up finding them likable anyway and kind of just got into how occasionally outrageous and on the nose they could be. I initially found the offbeat, off-key singing on the opener to be pretty bad, but later found something entertainingly charming in the unserious way it was delivered. I can even give Mind the Gap a pass if I treat it as like an Astiff movie style joke. Oh, whoops, looks like I died. Sucks for me. The album's concept is way easier to swallow if you just treat it as what it really is, i.e. a guy having fun with a bunch of his high school friends and incorporating them into this vibey, city-themed ambient techno album, instead of this forced statement on drug addiction or suicide that doesn't actually have anything to say on those topics and clearly has no idea how to properly handle them. And I think I mentioned before, my favorite track on the album, People Bond, resonated the most with me because it wasn't trying as hard to tie into the story, it instead felt like it was delivering the sentiment that, like, you know, represents your friends being around to support you, which felt more properly true to life for this artist. Really, this album's worst crime is that further ambition to try to be this dark concept record when that was never necessary for it to work in the first place. Its attempt to try and prescribe a deeper meaning to itself that it wasn't built for. I do relate to the idea of wanting to make these kinds of more ambitious concepts since even if they take way more work, forethought, and attention to detail to pull off, it is really inherently fulfilling if you are able to get it all to work and connect. It's a lot more of a risk that can theoretically lead to a greater reward. But first of all, I think it's really important for such a project to, you know, be more authentic to your real feelings and experiences, or at least show these kinds of feelings that you actually know how to portray. And even more importantly, sometimes you don't need to directly pin down a specific meaning behind ambient music, as it were. Sometimes it's better to just leave this kind of thing up to the listener's imagination and let them interpret their own meaning for themselves. If this album were more all instrumental and took out all the most on the no samples directly explaining the concept, honestly I'd have a way easier time recommending this to people and it might have even crossed into properly great territory. Because at the end of the day I still think all this stuff sounds really good and I was entertained by the whole experience from start to finish. 
I think the music itself is generally well produced, well crafted. I think the atmosphere is all quite nice. I think the grooves are all easy to sink myself into. I think the attempts at some catchier tracks succeed at being catchy. I think there's a sound and feel of this album that I can't really get out of any other project. I think he's got the ability to express some of his feelings into music. I even think this can actually be kind of funny on purpose sometimes. And most of my issues can be pretty much explained away by the artist still being a teenager. In spite of my issues, I do still think this album is pretty solid and don't think it's in danger of harming anyone or putting any questionable ideas out there. Especially given this video is probably going to be by far the most attention this artist has seen to date. At the end of the day, Cole is more of a statement of interest on where he might be taking his sound in the future. He may not be my personal favorite $10 Patreon request I've ever gotten. Deku unholds that title by a fairly significant margin. Uh, personal enjoyment-wise, this is more on par with artists like uh, Star Garage, Starlene, or Haunted Disco, which I've mentioned in some Stuff I Miss segments. And those artists could still beat this out depending on the kind of mood I'm in, or how much the concept of this one will annoy me. But this guy does now have the record for $10 Patreon request that gave me the most to actually say about. And uh, I think that is much more of a sign of even further potential down the line. I may have my problems with this project that'll probably prevent me from keeping it around longer term, but continue to keep up the good work, and maybe check this thing out if you're curious. I, I think I can still say I enjoyed this enough to give it a 7.5 out of 10. But of course, this is all just my opinion. You can feel free to disagree with it, but I'd like to hear your thoughts, so leave the comments in the comment thing down there. Shout out to my Patreon supporters, they're awesome people. You want to add yourself to that list, link to my Patreon is in the description. But yeah, that's pretty much it. That's all for today. See you next time. <laughs>